Hello guys, hello family, hello friends. This is Dr. T and welcome to Clinical Medicine with Dr. T. So guys, in this video, I want us to talk about the biochemistry of diabetes. So, diabetes, many times of course. So, um, it's going to be very basic, guys. It's going to be very basic. Um, it's going to be so basic that there's going to be a lot that I will leave out, but we'll still have a good understanding of the, the biochemistry of diabetes. So, um, let's start with... Um, so, we know that diabetes has, is, is, is basically a metabolic problem especially um, carbohydrate uh, metabolism. So now when you talk about carbohydrates, you know that in your diet you need your carbohydrates, your protein, your fat, your veggies, your water, and all of those things. Now, so in this video, we are going to concentrate on carbohydrates. So we all know that you can classify or divide carbohydrates into monosaccharides or simple sugars we know that um, monosaccharides are the simplest um, form or the basic the most basic units of carbohydrates if you combine monosaccharides, you get disaccharides. So if you get a long chain of disaccharides, a lot of disaccharides, then you get your polymers. Carbohydrate polymers. Right? So, For you to actually move from a monosaccharide, remember, you don't just wake up and one day you have a house. You take the simplest, uh, I mean, you take bricks and then you put cement and then you link them together and then you build, that's how you build a house. So if you're gonna move from this direction to that direction, then that's what you need. You need these um, basic units. And the basic units or the monosaccharides that we know of, it's things like, or it's sugars like, the most famous one, most common is glucose. Other one is galactose. Another one is fructose or fructose. And lastly, we have got manose, which we're not going to talk about, uh, much about it. So, if you want to move from here to here, you need special types of bonds. Your alpha one point, uh, your alpha one, four glycosidic bonds. So, if you take two glucose molecules. If you take two glucose molecules, you link them using your 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 alpha one four glycosidic bond, you're gonna get a disaccharide called maltose. If you take a glucose molecule, you combine it with galactose. get lactose if you take glucose you combine it with fructose you're gonna get glucose plus fructose or fructose you're going to get sucrose very important guys what i'm talking about here you'll appreciate it when we talk about the actual absorption of carbohydrates very very important 
Now, if you continue like that, linking these together, you're going to get to a point where you form glycogen, you form cellulose if you are a plant, you form starch, you form the sugars that you find in your nucleotides or your nucleotides. Right? So, this is very important, guys. Né? Um, so, when you are eating whatever that we eat that has got uh, carbohydrates, we're going to move from maybe starch, then we come here, we come here. This is what we can absorb. This is what our intestines can absorb. This is what our cells can use for energy. They can't use any of these. So that's why whatever that we eat, whatever carbs that we eat has got to be broken down to the simplest uh, sugars, right? Okay, now I'm going to wipe this so that we can have space. Now, let's say I come and I take my my toast and I take my whatever that I'm drinking. So this is there's a lot of carbohydrates in all those in those two things that I, I've just consumed. Now what's going to happen? So I'm gonna chew my toast by chewing I'll be breaking the bread into pieces so that the enzymes can actually um, have a, um, a good surface area to work on right so the mastication is gonna help with that and also forming the ball of food that has got to go down the, the esophagus when carbohydrates get to the stomach, there isn't a lot of um, digest digestion that happens. A lot of the digestion of carbohydrates happens in the intestines. So, this is our intestines. So what I'll do, I'll just elongate this and magnify it so that we can talk about it nicely. So, remember, the cells that line the intestines are called enterocytes so these are enterocytes and these enterocytes they've got these projections and this is called the brush border the brush border so this side the side of the of the enterocytes that is facing the lumen is called the apical membrane and the side that is facing the blood vessels is called the base or lateral membrane so this is our blood vessel so the plan is to take this break it down break it down into glucose so this will represent our glucose molecules right now when you saliva amylase is going to come and digest but when it gets to the stomach it's going to be de deactivated because it cannot function in a base in an uh, in, a, in an acidic an acidic environment but when the food gets to the stomach i mean to the intestines pancreatic amylase will come in and digest but pancreatic amylase does a very good job but it doesn't complete the job so whatever that you have eaten you'll find that plus minus 90% of whatever that you ate which is a carbohydrate based plus minus 90 percent you are gonna form glucose but you will still find there's glucose that is still uh, attached to another glucose molecule there is still glucose that is attached to another um, fructose molecule and then there's also glucose 
that is still attached to another galactose, right? But very few. But here is the thing. It's easy to move glucose across the apical membrane into the enterocyte, then eventually into the blood. But these ones, you can't take them in. They don't have carrier proteins to help them to enter. And another thing that we need to remember, guys, is that glucose cannot enter the apical membrane on its own or by itself. It needs a carrier protein. Because glucose is, is hydrophilic, so it cannot enter by it, itself. So, I'm going to draw this carrier protein here. This is the carrier protein that helps glucose to enter, right? So, how does this happen? Please pay attention, guys. This is very, very important. On the basolateral membrane of these cells, there is a um, there is a sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium pump. That sodium potassium pump, what it does, it takes out sodium and allow potassium to enter the cell. This is where glucose absorption begins. Now, as this um, sodium potassium ATPase keeps kicking out sodium ions, it will, de it will deplete the sodium that is inside the cell. Now, in the food that we eat, we also have some sodium ions. Remember, in the bread, there is sodium chloride. There is salt in the things that we eat. So, once the sodium that is inside the cell has decreased in, if you, com if you compare the sodium inside here to the sodium that is outside in the intestinal lumen, there will be a gradient. There's going to be a higher concentration on the in, in the intestinal lumen compared to the intracellular sodium. So what will sodium do? It will be like, oh, okay, since I've, there's a lot of me this side, let me just enter through this, um, this gate, which we're gonna talk about. So it enters through there, that's the sodium now. The black is the sodium, guys, right? The sodium enters. As the sodium enters, it it's moving down its concentration gradient and the gradient was created or is created by that sodium potassium pump right but when sodium is busy doing that glucose is like no you can't leave me behind i'm going with you and then glucose starts to get into the cell as well now you've got glucose molecules and, and sodium ions inside the cell so that's how glucose enters the enterocyte. Now let's talk about this guy. What is that guy? So, that carrier protein is called the sodium glucose linked transporter. Sodium glucose linked transporter. It's a sodium, it allows sodium to go in and also glucose also to go in. It transports both of those, sodium glucose linked transporter. Glucose cannot enter without sodium. This ATPase has got to create a gradient so that sodium can move down its concentration gradient and enter the enterocyte, right? And then glucose takes advantage of that, of that uh, situation. So this sodium glucose a linked transporter, it's type 1. Specifically, that one is type 1. Where do you find type 2? We spoke about it on our video last week. We were, talk we were talking about how does glycosuria actually happen. 
that's um, SGLT2. It's found in the kidneys in the proximal tubule. But that's not what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about this one today. So that's SGLT1 that allows both sodium and, uh, and, and, um, and glucose to enter. And this is a co-transporter, guys. It's a co-transporter. Meaning, it allows two molecules to enter. As we can see, it allows an ion and glucose molecule to enter. So it allows two things to actually enter uh, or to pass through it. And what type of a co-transporter it is? It is a symporter. Or a symport. What is a symport? A symport is a co-transporter that allows two substances or two molecules to pass through it, but in the same direction. Look, sodium is moving into the cell and glucose is also moving into the cell. That's why it's called a symport or a symport. They are carrier proteins that are called antipods. So those ones, they allow two molecules to enter, but in different directions. For instance, if this was an antipod, sodium would enter uh, the cell while glucose is leaving the cell, but using the same carrier protein, that's an antipod. We also have got transporters that only allow one molecule or one ion to enter, either enter or, or, leave, uh, or leave the cell. Those are called unipod. Symport, I don't want to confuse you guys, but I just want you to understand things at a broader, um, um, whatever, the broader con, yeah, the broader context. So that you don't only know a symport only, or know about the uniport, you know about an antipod as well. Okay, now, we've got a lot of glucose that is inside. We've got a lot of glucose that is inside the cell now. But that's not what we want. We want our glucose to be in the blood. How do we get it into the blood now? There's a second class of, of uh, glucose transporters. So this one, SGLT1, is found on the apical membrane. But the one that we're going to be talking about now, which is called, uh, let me write it. It's called a facilitated diffusion glucose transporter. It's a facilitated diffusion glucose transporter. So this is how glucose exits the basolateral membrane into the blood. Now you've got a lot of glucose that is in here. Let's talk a bit about the facilitated um, diffusion glucose transporter. So it's, it's a carrier protein as well, just like that one. Remember these two are glucose transporters but they are different types this one as you can see the name facilitated diffusion so it means now once you have created a situation whereby you've got a lot of glucose inside the cell you've got a lot of glucose now that is inside the cell when you compare the glucose that is inside the cell with the glucose that is in the in the blood or in the capillaries there is a gradient so glucose will move from its um, region of high concentration to a region of its low concentration but because we know glucose cannot just sip or cannot just uh, diffuse through the membranes the cell membranes without the carrier protein that's why we need that glut the carrier protein as well so so glucose go uh, exits the cell moving down its concentration gradient using that um glucose transporter the facilitated glucose transporter 
it it has the 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 um, the, the the capillaries like that. I hope you guys you get this. Remember, diffusion can be diffusion. You've when you've got diffusion, you've got um 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 a molecule or ions that are moving down their concentration gradient right now if you've got a bilipid layer and you've got a lot of let's say you've got glucose here and this glucose has got to cross this bilipid layer <coughs> sorry if this glucose they didn't require a carrier protein and it just sits in between the bilipid layer and enter or cross the bilipid layer in that manner that would be a simple diffusion but the glucose that we know it's not able to just pass the bilipid like a uh, layer like that so for it to move from its high concentration to its region of low concentration it needs a carrier protein so it uses that gate to pass. That's what is happening there. So this is a simple diffusion. This is a facilitated diffusion. Now on the other side, that's how you accumulate a lot of sugar now from what you ate into the blood. Let's go back. We said that as much as about 90% of whatever that you have eaten, you're going to break it down into glucose. But what about the the the, di, the disaccharides that you couldn't break down? So what's going to happen with these ones is that on the apical membrane, you've got special enzymes that they are called brush border enzymes. Those brush border enzymes, their names are sucrase lactase maltase remember that's why I had to go back and explain what a disaccharide is and what are the how do you get a disaccharide what do you what some sugars do you link together to get a disaccharide we said that you link a glucose with a fructose then you get sucrose you link a glucose with another glucose molecule and then you get uh, maltase. You link glucose with, that, with, gal with galactose, then you get uh, lac lactose. So sucrase breaks down sucrose. Lactase breaks down lactose. Maltase breaks down maltose. So now if you've got disaccharides, these brush border enzymes will break this down and forming more and forming more glucose because in in sucrose you've got glucose in lac in lactase you've got glucose in maltase you've got glucose right so those are your brush border enzymes that complete diffusion i mean that complete digestion of carbohydrates because remember we said that uh, pancreatic uh, amylase comes in and and does a partial job doesn't finish everything now these guys they take over and make sure that whatever that we transport inside here is a simple sugar now maybe you ask yourself on those uh, uh, monosaccharides we said that we have we've got glucose we've got <clears throat> galactose and we've got fructose I'm not going to talk about manos ne? so we understand now how do we get glucose from here to the blood what happens with these two guys because not, they also have got to pass through as well but how do they pass through galactose if you understand how glucose moves from the intestinal lumen into the inter in, uh, into the enterocytes and out of the enterocytes on the basolateral membrane into the blood. That's just how um, galactose also 
So Galatos does the same thing. It follows the same path or the same pathway. So if you understand glucose, you understand how uh, and how um, Galatose also gets absorbed because it's the same pathway. But with fructose, it's different. Fructose, it exits through a GLUT5. Remember, this is a GLUT what? Oh, I forgot to mention that. So there are different types of GLUT. There are three classes of the GLUT. There's class one, there's class two, there's class three. Class one is from one to four. Then class two, there are many, there's five, there's seven, there's eight, nine. But the special one that we're gonna talk about is five because this is the one that allows fractals to actually exit the to exit the enterocyte into the blood. That's GLAD5. Then this one here for glucose and galactose, as we mentioned it, it's GLAD1. 